Hello, everyone. Uh, great to be with you today. Hope you're all well across the country. And um, today we're going to be talking about um, a topic that is uh, in some ways dear to my heart because uh, a group of us have been working on, on this area now for a number of years. And uh, you'll find out a bit more about this as, uh, as the session goes on today. So pleasure to be with you. And um, yeah, so this is uh, any disclosures. So this is basically just grant support. Um, and I've highlighted Private Anonymous Foundation because uh, some of this work is actually funded by a private anonymous foundation, which is quite amazing. And um, the only support to this program is through the Public Health Agency of Canada. And we try to be as evidence-based as possible and we watch out for bias. So if you perceive bias, you need to let us know, et cetera. So the learning objectives for today. So by the end, I'm hoping you'll be able to list some of the negative health impacts associated with social isolation and loneliness, be aware of developing international approaches to reduce it, and to be able to reflect on how you can assess factors that contribute to social isolation and loneliness and then recommend appropriate interventions for, for your patients, clients, etc. And just to note that, um, as Megan said, this is a joint program with CCSMH and um, we are associated with CAGP. And one of the things we've done a lot of, as you probably know, are, is guideline development and so this is, and this is a very uh, crazy few months for us because our first ever anxiety guidelines for older adults were just released and are available on our website, which is up there. And that's really exciting. And today I'll be talking about new guidelines that are coming out around social isolation and loneliness. This is the outline for today. So covering um, just a variety of different perspectives on this issue. Um, and uh, and then we'll we'll hone in then on the CCSMH project, which is actually creating clinical guidelines, and then looking at possible interventions for um, healthcare and social service providers. And then hopefully we'll have a, a robust discussion because it's a topic that I think we can all relate to in our own lives and and with our our patients and clients. So. So it was Mother Teresa who said that the most terrible poverty is loneliness and the feeling of being unloved. And U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy said that we live in the most technologically connected age in the history of civilization, and yet rates of loneliness have doubled since the 80s. Um, and so in spite of all our social media, et cetera, et cetera, people are still lonely and younger people are lonely. So we talk about these two concepts as though they're one, but they're not. So social isolation is much more of an objective finding. It's You can measure it by the, the actual deficiency or the actual number in uh, social relationships that a person has and how much time they spend with other people, et cetera. Uh, loneliness is a much more subjective experience. It's it's an unpleasant sensation, and it's felt when a person's social relationships are lacking in quality or quantity compared to what they desire. And of course, what, what people desire varies dramatically. Um, and they do not totally overlap. So you can be uh, very isolated, but not lonely, and the opposite. So it's important for us to remember that, that they overlap considerably, but not entirely. Um, it is said that there may be different types of loneliness. Social, emotional, existential is one way of characterizing uh, the, the subtypes. So uh, social is really the absence of social connection, whereas emotional is much more the absence or loss of meaningful relationships that meet that deeply felt need to be recognized and belong. Um, another type of loneliness that's been described is, is a sort of human existential loneliness, which gets kind of philosophical and very interesting, but it's, it's, it's regarding the separateness that we all feel in some ways from others, 
and that may vary dramatically from person to person. And a sense perhaps that uh, uh, that uh, that uh, the universe is vast. The the actual universe is vast, and we may feel lonely within that vast universe. Um. Yes, the pandemic. No question that the pandemic has highlighted this issue dramatically, and and virtually all of us felt some degree of isolation and or loneliness during the pandemic and many of us may still be feeling some of the after effects of that and and uh, we certainly see that in some of our patients no question at all this is an image from the uk uh, this is the first of a couple of poll questions so and i'd like you to um Give an honest answer to this one. So when you're doing a new assessment, how often do you actually ask patients specifically about loneliness? Thank you. Thanks a lot. That's really helpful. Appreciate that. Thanks. Okay, and uh, can you see the results, Farah? Yeah. So yeah. So as you can see there, that uh, the about half just say occasionally we ask about it, and then others more often, a small group always ask about it. So, um, so that's very helpful. And um, I think one thing we're hoping through all of this and this big project we're doing is that people will move from occasionally to to much more often. That's one of our big hopes. Is that uh, we won't forget to ask about this because it's different from the things we usually ask about, about depression and anxiety and so many things we ask about in mental health, but um, uh, it, not necessarily loneliness. And, and that speaks to um, some quotes from, or a quote from Frieda from Reichman, who was a, a German-American psychiatrist. And, and this quote comes from 1959, so that's quite a long time ago, but she noted, quotes, a strange reluctance on the part of psychiatrists to seek scientific clarification of the subject of loneliness. And thus, it comes about that loneliness is one of the least satisfactorily conceptualized psychological phenomena, not even mentioned in most psychiatric textbooks. She goes on to say that loneliness seems to be such a painful, frightening experience that people will do practically everything to avoid it. Really, really strong statements here. And um, just for you to reflect on, do you, do you agree with this? Do you think there's something to what she's saying here? We could maybe discuss that later. And this is an image, you know, it's uh, musicians and, and, and uh, artists often, uh, their work is often, they, they, they focus on a lot of emotional issues always, right? And and the loneliness comes up so often in, in popular songs and in music and, and in art. And um, this is, a, of course, a, the lyrics from uh, Lennon and McCartney, the Beatles. I think they're very evocative. And no less so is this image from Kay Sage, who is an American um, surrealist painter with a very interesting and sad history. She was... Um, the uh, partner of Yves Tongue, who was a well-known uh, French surrealist painter, and she was an excellent painter in her own right, as you can see here. But when he died, she became deeply depressed. She also had lost a lot of her vision, which for an artist is, is terrible, of course. And, and um, she, she eventually died um, from uh, suicide. So here's the second poll question. So uh, DSM, of course, Diagnostic Bible. So is loneliness included in the DSM as a criterion for any mental disorder? Yes or no? That's great, thank you. Thanks so much. So we've got, um, got about 70% saying no and 30% and saying yes. And uh, so it turns out that the answer is 
Mostly no. <laughs> it's not mostly no. Um, but uh, I can. So the answer is actually yes. So it is one of the eight criteria for um, prolonged grief disorder, and I think that makes eminent sense. So. Um, which is uh, includes an intense yearning or longing for the deceased person and a preoccupation with thoughts or memories of that person. And then there's um, three out of eight different symptoms, and one of those is intense loneliness. So I think I think uh, that does make sense. Now the DSM five is uh, that book there. The full version is uh, one thousand and fifty pages long, and this is the only mention of loneliness in the whole textbook, which is a very comprehensive book that describes in great detail many, many, many um, mental disorders. So mostly no, but yes, the answer is yes. It's just kind of a trick question. But um, Here are some of the risk factors for um, loneliness and isolation. And these all sort of ring true and make sense. Um, and some of them relate to physical illness and sensory loss and living situation. Living alone would be at the top, of course. Um, but experiencing major life transitions is critical and something for us to always be aware of and to think about. And I think that's another sort of key message in, um, in this work is when you're thinking about people, think about risk factors and which of our, our patients are uh, potentially going through a life transition that could lead to isolation and loneliness. And is there anything we could do to help them through that? Um, you know, th there are other factors that make a lot of sense. There are psychological and cognitive vulnerabilities, um, including depression and low self-esteem, various anxiety problems, um, living in a rural location. Um, and um, of course, having a small network social network to begin with, speaking a language primarily other than English, and then belonging to a minority group. So all of these are considered risk factors. And there is what's considered to be a downward spiral of loneliness based on our negative thoughts, um, which um, uh, leads to us potentially being more withdrawn from other people because we don't feel good about ourselves or others perhaps, and there's sort of overlap with depression, of course, here. Um, and then the person becomes less active and then more negative and further withdrawal and increased severity of loneliness. And um, the question is, you know, how do we intervene? And obviously if thoughts and feelings are the challenging issue, it raises issues like can cognitive behavior therapy break this, this spiral, this cycle? Now, you know, you read everything day after day about the dangers of isolation and loneliness, um, but like everything, we have to have a balanced view. And um, it's actually an article in the Globe and Mail on the weekend about this, that um, balance is important and solitude for most of us has its benefits. So it's not like we all wanna be totally connected all of the time with other people, That that's actually scary. And most of us need some time alone, but it's a matter of balance. And so, there's certainly some evidence that solitude can be uh, uh, pleasant and productive and 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 it, it can help us to be stronger and it can spark creativity. I think a lot of artists um, f find that uh, working alone is, is really important and having that time to be alone. Um, so, you know, many opportunities here. So it's not, it's solitude is not all bad and people vary a lot in terms of how much solitude they want. Um, yeah, and this was even a, a study suggesting that um, that people have higher levels of, of solitude. This can predict personal growth, psychological richness, richness, and foster a type of well-being centered not around positive affect, but around psychological depth, or what scholars call a psychologically rich life. So, um, yeah, and there's also um, evolutionary theories of loneliness. Um, that as social creatures who want to um, reproduce, loneliness may spur us to have more relationships. And um, interesting proverb there, African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. It's a great proverb. So how common is, is social isolation and loneliness? And if you read 
you know, papers or, or uh, the media, you'll get all sorts of different numbers. <laughs> and it turns out that studies are very inconsistent. Even things like, you know, men versus women, gender, uh, sorry, culture and age. Um, the numbers are all over the map. Um, it's been assumed that loneliness increases with age. Uh, turns out that that may not actually be true at all. And um, there are different studies showing different data. Um, this is a prevalence of Nangus Reed survey a few years ago, pre-pandemic, right? And even pre-pandemic, we get 21%. This is across all ages, reporting 21% reporting being very lonely and 27% somewhat lonely. Um, this is data from the um, longitudinal study of aging in Canada. And what we saw, not surprisingly, were significant increases through the pandemic, not surprising at all. Um, and then the latest survey from a National Institute of Aging um, survey found that Canadians aged 80 years or older are the least likely to report experiencing social isolation and loneliness. <laughs> so what do we make of that? That's really interesting. Um, and uh, in, in this group, which was for middle-aged and older adults, it was the, the group that uh, were 50 and 60 to 64 that were more lonely. And then there's all sorts of studies showing great levels of loneliness among younger people. So, um, so is this a health issue or a social issue? Well, th these are the core determinants of health that include social support networks and social environments. So it's, it's a health issue and a social issue. Um, Julianne Holunstad and colleague uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine a few months ago or a year ago actually wrote this. They said that social isolation and loneliness are rarely listed on death certificates, yet they may have contributed to the excess deaths from all causes observed during the pandemic. And although the health sector cannot solve this problem alone, the medical community does need to respond. Clinicians will require adequate training, resources, and support to integrate screening, interventions, and referrals into their existing responsibilities. They conclude by saying that patients' lives may hang in the balance. That's pretty dramatic, very dramatic. And then, well, why are they saying that? Because of all this data that suggests a strong association with negative health outcomes, as you can see here, very significant increases in risk for a variety of serious physical illnesses for dementia, um, and, and a significant increased risk of death. These are associations, and there's multiple reasons why this might be the case, of course, and this tries to explain some of it, uh, considering lifestyle issues, psychological factors, whether people who are socially isolated and lonely are less likely to take their medications or go to, go to healthcare providers, follow diet, et cetera. And then there appear to be physiological changes in the body that um, are also associated, more inflammation, higher blood pressure, different gene expression that's been interestingly studied, um, uh, suggesting increased risk of um, a whole variety of genetic changes that can increase your risk for illness. All of this leading to more morbid morbidity and mortality. On the other hand, there's all sorts of studies on the flip side showing that social participation has all sorts of benefits. So it's been studied in both directions. Of course, when it comes to mental health, there's a strong association with depression and anxiety. Um, and an interesting quote from um, the uh, Harvard study of adult development, that close relationships, more than money or fame, are what keep people happy throughout their lives and that those ties protect people from life's discontents, help to delay mental and physical decline, and are better predictors of a long and happy life than social class, IQ, or even genes. And that proved true across multiple different socioeconomic groups. Not surprisingly, there's more loneliness in marginalized communities. These are from studies in the United States, but it's really across all, all groups, minority groups. And there's actually an excellent document on social isolation of seniors with a focus on indigenous seniors in Canada that came out a few years ago. So, um, 
Internationally, Kiffer Card uh, and colleague wrote an interesting uh, a, a article on um, how different countries are tackling this problem. And they concluded that the federal government in Canada has no strategy or policies to address loneliness specifically. Um, and then, of course, the United Kingdom appoints a minister for loneliness and a whole program, their campaign to end loneliness, which received significant funding and has led to a lot of interesting approaches and outcomes. Um, Japan also more recently appointed a minister for loneliness. These are uh, some important documents, a couple from the United States, one from Canada. This looked like a, a really exciting paper on prevalence of loneliness across 113 countries, but um, turns out what they may basically said is they don't have enough data to make very many conclusions. <laughs> they did say that there's there seem to be um, lower levels of uh, loneliness in northern European countries, uh, which seems odd to me. And and this was reflected not from this is not from that paper, but from another um, document looking at, at data from other countries, and it suggested that. Um, in, in this particular um, group of studies, that, that there was more loneliness, uh, in, this is in older adults, um, in um, Mediterranean countries like Greece, Israel, and Italy, compared to um, Central or Northern European countries, or indeed the United States. And uh, I, I kind of chuckle on this, because I don't actually believe it. And um, I believe it may well reflect the capacity of people in Mediterranean countries to actually express and be in touch with their emotions more so than the northern and central Europeans and, and uh, but that's my that's my hypothesis I'd be interested in yours so um, it brings us to the CCSMH project funded by a private foundation we are creating clinical guidelines which interestingly enough as far as we know no one has ever done before maybe because loneliness is not actually a diagnosis per se, but um, so we've been working for the last two years to develop guidelines, which will launch in just a few weeks on the 26th of February. A few sneak previews in, in the next few slides. Um, in order to uh, do this work, we did all of the things that you do to create guidelines. We also did a couple of national surveys with health and social service providers and older adults themselves. And we've tried to do um, uh, awareness raising and network strengthening as well as, as creating the guidelines. This is the group of, um, of folks from across the country who worked on it, a really fantastic group of uh, dedicated experts from different backgrounds and fields, some more clinical, some more academic. Great CCSMH staff who've worked with us and supported the project and uh, two consultants, research consultants that you can see listed there on the bottom right. Yeah, so we didn't find any existing guidance because when you create guidelines, the first thing you do is see what's out there and see if they're adaptable. And uh, these are the this is the kind of literature we looked at, so the sort of standard academic literature, but also the gray literature and uh, any literature related to patient experience. These are the categories within the guidelines, prevention, screening, assessment, interventions. Um, so we do recommend a targeted screening for older adults at risk. So I put up the risk factors earlier. And then we recommend the use of screening tools whenever possible, um, as, list, as listed here. And we, we do list a number of tools that we think are um, particularly good. I won't go into them all here, but um, here's a couple of examples. So there is actually a single item on loneliness. So if you're you only want to ask one question, ask one question, but do ask it. The UCLA loneliness scale is interesting. It's just three questions that you can see there. Um, but interestingly, this is the loneliness scale. But it doesn't actually ask if you're lonely, right? It doesn't. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> interesting. Um, one interesting scale is called the CARED scale that um, was actually created by one of the uh, uh, individuals on our panel. Uh, Nancy Newell and a colleague in uh, University of Manitoba. And this is a nice scale because it, it actually leads to um, a, a prompt that might tell you whether to refer someone for, for help based on these particular questions that you ask about. 
Um, as with any guidelines, we do highlight the need for a comprehensive assessment, and we list some of the key components that we think the assessment should include, recognizing that, you know, um, scope of practice varies amongst different uh, health and social service providers. And um, But these are things we think that it's important to ask about, medical, social, mental health histories, cognition, screening for substance use, understanding the environment and the financial situation of a person, recent life events, lifestyle factors, and whether the person has insight and motivation for change. And then, okay, what about interventions? So, um, yeah, so in our practices, in our literature review, these were the areas that came up. We particularly looked at systematic reviews, meta-analyses, um, actually, um, uh, turns out that, you know, you can't say that there's one intervention that's the very best intervention. And I think that would make sense to all of you. But so, um, yeah, there wasn't a standout intervention, um, but interventions that appear to be most likely to produce positive outcomes incorporate multimodal group and peer components. Um, so we wanted to emphasize an overall approach that it's important to um, to ensure initially or concurrently that treatment is provided for any underlying medical or mental health conditions identified in the assessment. So for example, if um, the person has a serious depression um, that could be uh, making them socially isolated, contributing significantly, then it's important obviously to, to, to help that person with some kind of intervention treatment for the depression. Um, or if it turns out a person has become very socially isolated because their hearing has become seriously impaired and they're not, they haven't uh, used any hearing aids, then that could be a very critical intervention. So it's not like um, the, the, the intervention for everybody is, is simply to get more socially connected. So we do recommend an individualized approach, of course, with shared decision making and, and trying to discuss with the person what are their interests, what kind of interventions would likely work for them, what kind of contacts and, and in the community would, would make sense for them. Um, and then recognizing the diversity within older adult populations. Um, and, and this is the list of, of, so for each of these, there's a recommendation, social prescribing, social activities per se, physical activity, psychological therapies, animal assisted therapies and ownership, leisure skill development and activity, technology where uh, it can obviously assist many people as we found out in the pandemic, of course. Um, and we, we talked to pharmacological treatment, but we do say that there's no specific drug for loneliness, but there may be a medication to treat an underlying condition like depression. Um, and there's overlap between some of these intervention categories as well. We recognize that. Uh, social prescribing, there's a real movement towards social prescribing, which um, can be defined in different ways, but it's really an organized approach between healthcare and social services to help patients make the right connections and contacts in the community. Um, and uh, often those resources uh, may be out, actually outside of the healthcare system, um, but it's making it happen and making it um, a prescription. Some people say it's like writing it out on a prescription. And I've seen examples of that where people actually use a prescription pad, but it goes beyond that. And uh, so this particular recommendation has quite a bit of detail in it because we think it's very important. Um, there are uh, there have been programs that have developed link workers or system navigators who play a critical role in in connecting the person to resources in the community and obviously that's a, like gold dust if you can find a link worker or a, or a community that has a link worker that's great I think it's still a um, a process that's developing and being funded um, but we need many more of these so. By the way, you know, we it's hard in the literature to differentiate interventions that may be more effective for loneliness versus isolation, but um, 
For loneliness per se, there is some indication that interventions that target social cognition can be helpful, like CBT, social skills training, um, and so on. So I think um, the psychological interventions may have more benefit specifically for loneliness, and I think that makes sense. By the way, there was one great review by Bethel and, and colleagues around um, interventions specifically in long-term care homes, and they reviewed a whole variety of studies, but it was interesting that one of the ones that came out on top, as you'll see there, is the management of pain. Now, that's interesting, and one you might not think of, but people who are chronically, in, who have chronic pain may not have the desire or energy to connect with other people, and so helping um, with the pain may actually um, have secondary effects of alleviating um, isolation and loneliness. And finally, um, you know, when we think about this whole challenging issue, uh, we can look at it from different levels. So, um, you know, you can help an individual, communities can come together, society itself um, can develop policies and programs that can be designed to help social connection. And so I think it's important to think of this at multiple levels, um, creating Clinical guidelines are a part of this, but only a part of the big picture. And that's emphasized by um, Vivek Murthy. This is from the Surgeon Generals of the United States' report from 2023. Uh, and he has six pillars that uh, he suggests are vitally important. Um, and mobilizing the health sector, like us, is number three. But there are a whole variety of other broader approaches um, including research, um, but oh, but you know he's advocating trying to change the uh, the whole culture of connection in our society. That's an ambitious an ambitious one, but it's in there. So uh, to conclude, then, um, so there are multiple perspectives and theories regarding social isolation and loneliness. The prevalence data regarding age, gender, and culture are inconsistent but we know there are strong associations with poor health outcomes. Our guidelines will be the first to address this issue, uh, as far as we know, <laughs> and there are many possible interventions for us to consider. Uh, we, 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 we emphasize an individualized approach and shared decision-making, and we believe that the solutions are possible at the society, community, and individual level. A few countries have taken a national approach to this, um, and this is a rhetorical question, but what, you know, what approach should Canada take? Should we take a national approach? Love to get your thoughts on that. Uh, there's my email if you have any, um, any questions or queries after this session today. And also I put up the uh, email of our um, project manager, Betty Watson-Borg. And again, the website of CCSMH. <laughs>